Salutations, people. Welcome to Page Three Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed, a podcast where we dive into murder cases that went unnoticed by the nation's newspapers. Hello, Shay. Hey, John. Hello, people. Hi, guys. And welcome to Episode 5 of Page Three Killers, Murders That Went Unnoticed. Yes, welcome back for another installment. We got a really good case this week. I am super excited for this one. What's this one? Uh, what's this one called? We this, got a name for it yet? Uh, this one is Charles Frederick Albright. So we are going to get into this episode, but first, we have some announcements. Yes. So we have a Patreon account now. So you guys can go on. And if you want to support us with a monetary donation, donation you can. And then uh, you can also like, share, and subscribe all of our videos. Yeah. And you can leave us a review. Because now we're up on iTunes. Yes. That's super exciting. iTunes. I think we'll be up on Google and Stitcher and whatever the other big one is. I can't remember. Twitch or whatever. No, not no, Twitch. Not I Twitch. forget what it is. But we'll be up there probably by the end of this week. Yeah, what about it? Oh my god. I can't remember what I was going to say. Thanks for interrupting, babe. That's my job. <laughs> um, also, oh, I we are now up on Facebook. So you guys can check out our Facebook page. Get updates on when episodes are going to air. When we're going to be posting our new uh, mini episodes. Oh, that's another announcement, yeah called Headline Minis. We did bring this up in our uh, Valentine's Day post video. Yeah, well, episode. Yeah, in our, in our little Valentine's Day episode. So you can check out those. And what are they again? The Headline Minis. And they're going to be mini episodes for of uh, the big news stories that happen during some of our cases that we're looking at. So you're just going to be going over the reasons why people don't know about our, our murders in the first place? Yeah, so some of the more interesting headline topics, I, I'll pick a couple out of each episode, one or two, and then I'll just do like a quick 10-minute video or something like that for each one of those. Sounds good. No schedule, right? No just schedule. Kind of, just kind of whenever, whenever they come out. Yeah, so I'm going to try to get them out like once or twice a week, but don't quote me on that, people. Oh, before we go any further, John, what about our drink for today? And we're back with another drink segment. Hopefully you guys are picking up these uh, these recipes on the Patreon ahead of time so you can have a, a quick drink with us. Helps you, helps you enjoy the episode. Because God knows we're not that entertaining. Uh, <laughs> so what we have this week is a martini because there's certain types of condiments that you eat with martinis that resemble elements of the case. We'll put it that way. Uh, (laughs) uh, So the first thing you need to know about a martini is it's made with gin, not vodka. Don't let 007 fool you. If you ever order a martini and they automatically give you vodka, they are wrong. Uh, So we're going to start off... Our our martini, a dirty martini, the dirtiest martini, as a matter of fact. Uh, We're going to start that off with four ounces of your favorite gin. Uh, I prefer Bombay Sapphire or Tanqueray, Uh, but, you know, you pick you. Uh, Beef Eaters is always good. Uh, There's a local one from Pennsylvania, so if you're in the area, uh, Faber, they're a local distiller. They are actually... They're probably my favorite, but you probably can't get that where you're at. But if you can, uh, look them up. So we got four ounces of that. And then just a splash of vermouth. And that's just a martini. That's all you ever need for a martini. It's the simplest drink ever. But gin is so tasty that you really don't need much. Uh, now to make it a dirty martini, you add one to two ounces of olive juice. That's straight from the jar. Uh, you know, depending on how dirty you want it. I said this is the dirtiest martini, so I say just go for f- two ounces. Just make it as sour 
and as briny as possible. Uh, I think it's delicious, but whatever. And here's the important part. The garnish. The garnish makes it all. You take three pitted olives, and you remove the pimentos, and you put them on a, on a, on a little, uh, little pick, and you just, you drop that right near your martini glass, and as you're drinking, you just get to, you get to munch on some, uh, some snacks. Now the important part, again, you have to remove the pimentos, or hey, if, if you feel really frisky, get the jalapeno ones. But be prepared. It's gonna be spicy. But you gotta remove it, and you'll find out soon. Why? But that's our drink for the week. Yeah, babe. Uh, one quick question. Is that shaken or stirred? Don't be a fool. You have to shake it. James Bond was a, w- was a ridiculous human being. He got a vodka. No, did he get a shake? Yeah, shaken, not stirred, right? That's how he ordered? Yeah, you would never stir a martini. That makes no sense to me. But he got it with vodka, so he's wrong. Back to the show. And we're back. Yeah, so our topic today is Charles Frederick Albright, and he was a Texas serial killer down back in to Dallas. Texas. Yeah, back to Texas this for this week's episode. So before we get started, this all takes place in 1990. Oh man, I miss the 90s. I can't remember now. I was only, what, four? I was four years old in 1990. I, actually, I remember asking the teacher when I was in school why we needed the second nine. That's, I was like, why don't we just call it 190? Because we're learning numbers. I was like, it seems redundant to me. <laughs> Obviously not using the word redundant since I was too stupid to realize. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about some of the news topics. Uh, the big news from 1990. So we have the dissolution of the USSR. The commies lost. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... The, they're no longer a communist country, which is, uh, it's Russia, right? I mean, that's kind of in quotation marks, but yeah, it went from being the United Soviet States of Russia to being just Russia. Yes. And then we had uh, Nelson Mandela, who was in prison for 27 and a half years, was released. Yep. South Africa, apartheid was ending. I can't remember when it officially ended. I don't think it officially ended until like 93 or something like that. But uh, this was at least the... Uh, the stranglehold was was loosening. Yes. And then we had the start of the Gulf War. Yeah, you end the Cold War, war you got to start another one. Exactly, because, uh, you know, our government just loves wars. We're always in one. Are we still in one? I think uh, we're still in one. I believe at the current moment we're involved in seven separate foreign <sighs> occupations slash fights, whatever you want to call them. Oh, my gosh. When are we just going to... But while we're ahead. <laughs> All right. Then, also in 1990, the first anti-stalking laws passed in California. Did they get to Pennsylvania yet? I do not do not know. I, You know what? I'll actually have to look into Pennsylvania stalking laws. We still haven't gotten you a stalker, so. <laughs> still waiting for one. Um, then we have the first digital camera was released in the United States in 1990. I'm assuming this was for commercial, like like the first yes. digital camera for commercial use. Cause yes, and then at the, I believe it said that in 94 was when the like personal use one was released. Oh, okay. Yeah. So That's this- crazy. 1990, they had, they had digital cameras? Yeah. I would not have, I would have, if you would have asked I- me, I would have said probably late 90s is when it was available. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a Page 3 Killers episode would not be a Page 3 Killers episode without the seedier side. So Yeah, because bombing people in the Middle East isn't seedy. Oh, yeah, totally. So we talked about we had the dissolution of the USSR. Now let me talk to you about Russia's worst serial killer. Andre Chikatilo is arrested. For, I believe the, the count was 149 murders. Oh, man. And he 149 did, murders? Jesus. Yeah. He, it, I mean, he was just cannibalizing people man, to they would, survive. They would arrest you for looking at someone wrong in the USSR. 
This guy got away with 149 murders? Yeah, like, this, I watched a documentary on this. He is so interesting. I wish it was a case that a lot of people didn't know about, but I feel like over the last few years, knowledge of him has definitely increased, so I don't think it would be a good case for this. Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry about that. We had the little can't notification. Tell. We've edited this out. <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about right now. Oh, man. Anyway, I want to see you. How do you pronounce that place? Nova Trakis? Novo Czechokrosk. Yeah, yeah, yeah good luck with that one. Anyone from Russia, let us know how to spell uh, N O V O C H E R K A S S K. There's not supposed to be two S's and a K's in any word. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Oh my. Sk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we got one more. We have in New Zealand David Gray. Kills 13 people on what would be known as the Aramona Massacre. Um, so I do, I actually do not know anything about this case. That See, one. We were also safe in America that year, apparently. Yeah. Um, I did not find anything super crime noteworthy in the United States. 1999. I, I can't remember. Yeah. I was, like I said, I was four. I can't remember that crap. All right. That is it for the news portion. <laughs> All right, we got Chucky Albright. Yes, Charles Frederick Albright. Interesting thing is, this case inspires a Criminal Minds episode. I'm not going to tell you guys which one it is, because then you'll know all about this case. But afterwards, go and check it out. It's definitely so much creepier once you have the background stuff. Because it was real. Yes. So we have Charles, and he was born on August 10th. 1933, and he was adopted uh, by Dell and Fred Albright. His adoptive mother was a school teacher. She was very strict, overprotective, you know, like one of those uh, hover moms. She was a tiger mom. Yeah, like, like, well, I wouldn't, yeah, I would call her a tiger mom. I would also, like, say that she was just, like, like a helicopter mom. Okay, you know, yeah, like yeah. One of those, that's, like, a new, that's a new term. Yeah. Probably slightly less racist than Tiger Mom. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so she was very strict, overprotective, and she was all about his education. So when he was a teenager, he got they his mom and dad bought him his first gun. And he liked to go out and hunt like small animals. And his mom got him into taxidermy. Okay, so at age 11, she enrolled him in the Northwest School of Taxidermy, and they would do this thing together. This was like their thing. They stuffed rabbits. They stuffed, yeah, small animals, birds, rabbits, like mostly birds from what I read was cool. his favorite thing to do. And then at age 13, he had already started his little petty crime life, you know, so he got caught stealing stuff, a couple accounts of aggravated assault, already starting at age 13. So we have two of the uh, triad of serial killers, right? Violent childhood history and then killing of small animals? It, well, it wasn't, he, he didn't seem to be killing them to torture them. It was, it seemed like he hunted them. Well, and did taxidermy. I think that's a little different. Like he's not he's not running around like letting Kale's their cat's tails on fire. I don't know. I don't know if I trust this guy. He's already looking shady. At age fifteen, he graduated from high school and enrolled in North Texas University, where he expressed interest in training as a medical doctor slash surgeon. But when he took his pre med training course, he failed. He was also 15. It's still pretty impressive. Yeah. And then uh, at the age of 16, he got into trouble with the police again. Uh, he got caught uh, with some stolen petty cash and two handguns and a rifle. And he spent a year in jail for that. See, if you ever talk to a lawyer, one of the, one of the best pieces of advice they'll ever give you is only ever commit one crime at a time. 
and never commit a crime with a gun. Because if you commit two crimes, you don't just get one sentence and then another. It's like you get it, it, it's like you get a sentence and then you get something added on to that sentence because you did something else, and then you get another sentence for the other crime. Yeah. Same thing with guns. If you ever get caught with a gun, no matter you you can get caught jaywalking and it'll add two years if it's if you got a gun on you. That's a lie. But don't commit crimes with guns and only commit one crime at a time. <laughs> That's <laughs> some some not legal advice from me. Some jailhouse lawyering. <laughs> It's not legal advice, but I heard it from a lawyer once. Yeah. After he's released from jail um, for that handgun stolen property thing, he attends uh, the Arkansas State Teachers College and majors in pre-med studies. But after being found with stolen items from some of his, like, dorm roommates... He's like a klepto. Yeah. So he... Yeah. So he's expelled... From there, after he's caught with some stolen goods. Charles then goes on to falsify his degree from the, that said university, from Arkansas State Teachers College. He falsifies the degree. He sold documents and forged signatures and gave himself a a fictitious bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So I, I was just reading the story, completely unrelated, but I, I think it's kind of interesting. There was this guy in the 1800s or something, yeah. and he went over to England to go to Oxford, and he completely blew like his his chances at Oxford. Ended up not graduating, failing his like doctoral thesis, but because like news didn't spread like it does now, like he just came back to America and just told everyone he has doctorates from Oxford, and like no one questioned it because it was you know, across the Atlantic at the time. So it would take three months to get a response. So, so what did he do? They, what did he do? <laughs> like, I forget exactly what he did, but he ended up, no one, no one figured it out for his entire life. He became, he became relatively famous and, and did some important things. I can't, oh, I wish I could remember what, who it was, but yeah. Huh. Turns That's out like faking your degree is not really that, uh, that hard? uncommon <laughs> or hard. Yeah. He marries, At this point in his life, he marries his college girlfriend, and they have a child together. But he's just not able to step away from that petty crime life. And he's caught forging checks. All about that life. And he was also caught when they found out that he faked his degree in education. And he was placed on probation. That doesn't seem too bad. Seems like it's worth the risk. Yeah. (laughs) Then in 1965, him and his wife, they separate and the divorce is finalized in 1974. Damn, nine years. Yeah. So he was caught stealing hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise from a hardware store and received a two-year prison sentence around that time. He serves less than six months of that sentence. Um, He gets off on good time, on a time... Time served and good behavior. Sure, yeah. I mean, I've never talked to the man, but he seems like he's probably relatively intelligent and can probably, uh, was probably just a generally nice guy until he takes your stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, we'll be getting into that in a little bit. So we still got I mean, up until now. We don't see, like, like, because all he's ever, like, his, his big, he just steals stuff. Like, I'm sure the aggravated assault was just attack on charge because he got caught stealing and he probably tried to get away. Yeah. At this point in time, he starts befriending and gaining the trust of his neighbors. Um, He also babysits uh, a lot of the kids in the neighborhood. In 1981, some friends that are visiting, uh, their daughter claims that he sexually molested her. Um, She's their 14-year-old daughter. Oh, you can just ignore everything I just said. (laughs) He was prosecuted, pled guilty, and received probation for that. Boy, we are in a different time. He got probation for that? Yeah. And then uh, he he later claimed to be innocent, but said that it was just easier to plead guilty to avoid the hassle. Yeah, if all you get is probation, that's probably true. Yeah. And then in 1984, he applies to be leader of a Boy Scout troop and was rejected. <laughs> I don't see why. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
they have background checks at this time? Can they even run background check in 1984? I, I do not know. That that would be interesting to look up, babe. Like, um, I'm, I'm sure you could, but like, I wonder if it's like, I can get a background check done in 15 minutes now. Like in 1984. It would yeah. probably take like, it was probably like, a, like you actually had to mail something to the FBI. You had to go through files. Yeah. And then in 1985, uh, he's living in Arkansas with Dixie. And this is like a girlfriend. They live together. Um, she moves in and it's his house, but she pays for everything. So she, he's like a... So she's a sugar mama. Yeah, he, she's his sugar mama. He, he does have a job, okay? He's a paper delivery guy. So he delivers newspapers early in the morning. But that was most likely just a cover to do his side thing, which was visit prostitutes. Can you call Dixie knowing. Can you call him ladies of the night if it was during the day? I, you know what? They, they said that he did run the route, and the route was like... Uh, two in the morning to like six in the morning. Yeah, so like seven o'clock. Like, is it really still? It's not nighttime at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So they're ladies of the very early morning. Yes. Now his friends and uh, family said that he was a real Renaissance man. He was fluent in French, Spanish. Uh, he was a masterful painter, uh, and he was able to woo women by playing Chopin. Preludes on the piano or reciting poetry by Keats. I told you, he's, he's, he's a charmer. Yes, he is a well-rounded individual who just happens to have some characteristic flaws. Yeah, but they, all artists that have That lead him flaws. to commit murders, rapes, and a ton of other bad things. But um, otherwise, he's a generally good bloke. i got to figure out what your character flaws are. <laughs> oh, I've got a, I got a list. <laughs> I'll let you check that out. <laughs> so now that we have talked about Charles's early life and petty crimes, let's talk more about his serious crimes. For a serial killer is more serial crimes. <laughs> yeah, so we have his first victim. So his first victim... Uh, is Mary Lou Pratt, and this takes place on December 13th of 1990. So right... How old you know, he's, uh, he's, he's 57 at this point, right? Uh, yes. I believe so. That seems a little older to be starting to kill people. Well, I mean, he, he had his parents sort of keeping him in check. I mean, he lived with his parents after his marriage broke down. He lived with them most of his life at... You know, yeah, before and after. But that was 25 years he lived with his parents then. Yeah. His, his, okay. well, he moved in after he separated with his first wife. With in his 1965. wife. In 1965. Yeah. In 1965, he moved back in with his parents. At this time in 1990, he is, he was. Oh, that's living right. He's, with he's Dixie. living with Dixie. And they weren't living together that long, maybe only a couple of years. So that time in between the breakdown of his marriage, which was like 20 some years. He was living back with his parents. Okay. And, I mean, his mom probably had a lot of control. So all of these actually start, I believe, after her death and his father's death. Okay. Okay. So Mary Lou Pratt was a 33-year-old prostitute that worked the Oak Cliff Cliff neighborhood of Dallas. Never heard of it. Yeah, so it's it's sort of like one of those areas, like Kensington for Philadelphia. You know, more, it's run down. You have more of the poor of the community living there. A lot of, like, closed up shops. You know, just not the, the best part of the city that you would want to live in. Now, her body was dumped in the lower class area of far south Dallas, and she was found wearing only a t-shirt and a bra. Now, res- a resident of this uh, neighborhood was so horrified at the sight of her body that he went into his house, he got a sheet from his closet and covered her body with a sheet, so... So he tampered with evidence? Yeah. So we have a little bit of that going on. 
when they did the autopsy, they they found that she had been shot in the back of the head with a 44 caliber handgun and was very badly beaten. At this time, we're about to get into his signature. All right, this is the thing that he does that only he does, okay? So Dr. Elizabeth Peacock, one of her staff pathologists, opened up Pratt's eyelids and was shocked by what she found. And I read several articles, and it was said that she exclaimed, Oh, my God, they're gone. Because her eyeballs were removed. So I wonder if she thought if, like, someone there lost them. Oh, my God, they're gone. <laughs> check, check, check everyone's pockets. Upon further look at this, they, you know, upon further inspection, they found that it wasn't just the eyeballs, but the tissue surrounding the eyeballs were, was cut perfectly. So it was almost surgical in nature as to how they were removed. That they, it was taken, great time was taken to remove her eyeballs. Kind of like someone who may have gone to pre-med. Yeah, hint, hint, pre-med school. Yeah, hint, hint. The guy we're doing this entire episode on may have yeah. done it. Although they did, <laughs> they did say that there was no operation like this that would would have been taught in medical school. Yes, random eyeball removal is not a is not a typical I, procedure. Yeah, like I've seen like them put an eyeball back in like after it's become dislodged from the amount of pressure, cranial pressure. Yeah, it's but like I'm popped at, out. I imagine but, you're not removing the eyelids. Yeah. Well, no, her eyelids weren't removed. Like the eyelids it her face just looked perfect. Like there was no, oh, oh. there was no cuts to her eyelids. Nothing. It was the actual eyeball and tissue inside of the eye socket. Gotcha. I misheard. I thought it was he removed the eyelids as well. No. no. Okay. So what you're saying was he yeah. didn't touch so, the eyelids. Yeah. So her eyes were closed when they found the body, and they didn't realize that her eyes were missing until they oh, went yeah, in to check the color of her eye. And the pathologist was like, oh, my God. <laughs> what? WTF? It's black. <laughs> it's empty. <laughs> There's no eyeball here. It's eye color, no. <laughs> eye color, none. Now, this was a difficult thing for the killer to do. And uh, he really had to know how to slip the knife around uh, the eye without causing injury to the adjoining skin. And then cut six major muscles holding each eye in the socket, as well as a rope, uh, a rope like optical nerve, the optical nerve, yeah. uh, from the back of the eyeball. The police are just like, okay, this is really, really strange. So they do what they're supposed to do, and they enter it into the FBI's Violent Crime Apprehension Program uh, unit's database. Now, this database will, you know, pull up if there's a ping on any other case just like this. It'll send them a, they'll get a message to them. Like, I don't know, pigeon? <laughs> that signal? Some sort of email? I'm guess. Did they have email in 1999? They had email in 1999. Yeah, it, well, I don't think you could actually, like, people couldn't get it, but. I think. You know, mili- major, institutions major institutions could use like it. police forces and stuff. So they enter it into the database, but not much really happened, you know, for a while. And what was really shocking about this was that her death only warranted a two a two paragraph story on the back section of the local newspaper because what, she was what a what prostitute. What name page three? Wasn't even page three. It was like all the way in the back. He said 1990. We're already yeah. like. Yeah. This ain't like 1920. This ain't like the Black Dahlia murder or some. No. Some hussy got murdered. Yeah, true. And I mean, well, back in, back during Dahlia's time, that that was really yellow journalism. So they just printed whatever they wanted. Like, it didn't have to be true. They just printed it. 
They could find somebody. They didn't check sources. One person says it. It must be true. So I just find that really sad that her life only warranted two paragraphs on the back of it very back of the newspaper. It's really sad. So our next case happens on uh, February 10th of 1991. And that would be Susan Beth Peterson. She's 27 years old. She is Caucasian. I did forget to mention that his first two victims are white, which we'll play in later as we go down this. And she was found on the same street that Mary Pratt was left on. Susan was also nearly naked. I believe she only had a, a shirt on, a t-shirt. She had been shot three times in the top of her head, her left breast, and in the back of her head. The medical examiner also found that her eyes had been removed exactly the same way as Mary Lou's. At this point, the investigators start realizing that they have a repeater. So a repeat offender who has a, the same mo, uh, modus operandi. The uh, same MO. Now, so they dig into her life a little bit. And they're just trying to find anything that they can to help them, you know, find out who killed her. And... Later on, they realized that their main suspect at the very end of this actually signed a, bond, a bail bondsman's application for her. So we have Charles Albright as a co-signer to bail her out of jail at the Ranger Bail Bonds. Wait, what just happened? He, so he, he, got her. Her, he got her out of jail. Yeah. So it, he bonded it, her out of jail once. He was probably a frequent flyer, Miles. Yes. He frequented the ladies of the night, and a lot of them, like, knew him. Very frequently. Yes. Okay. Um, and then other prostitutes um, said that Pratt started uh, turning tricks at the Star, which Albright was one of her best clients. He, or her best customer. <laughs> Don't give You're me that looking look. <laughs> You're looking for me to make a joke. I got nothing right now. I know. That Let's move into the third victim, okay? So we have Sherry Williams. Now, she is the third victim, and she is African-American. So she worked at the Avalon Motel during the day as a maid, and then at night, she was a prostitute. See, that's really convenient. Most people got to go somewhere else. For their second job, she gets to stay right there. Yeah, so Sherry Williams would leave from her job at the Avalon Motel, according to other prostitutes who saw her. She was wearing uh, jeans and a yellow raincoat that another prostitute had given her to borrow because it was raining out and she was just being a nice person. And this is probably what ends up getting her killed was the yellow raincoat. He probably thought she was a different prostitute because the the woman that did give it to her was white. Oh. So, and she had seen Charles earlier that night. That makes sense. Yeah. And uh, so that's how that goes. But she was found a block from an, a local elementary school and a waitress uh, at a restaurant across the street found uh, William's nude body propped up against a curb. Her eyes had been removed, just like the other two victims. She had um, some facial bruising and a broken nose and had been shot in the face and the top of her head. Now, they found several hairs that did not belong to her on her body, as well as an unopened condom, which was beside her body. The Medical examiner's field agent pulled back her eyelids and discovered that the eyes were missing. And at the autopsy, they found a broken tip of an X-Acto blade embedded in the skin near uh, where her right eye would have been. At this point, they, in all three of these cases, they have no witnesses, no murder weapon. Like, they could tell you what the caliber was because they have bullets bullets and all, um, and no fingerprints. 
But now they got hair. But they do have these several hairs. And a brand new invention. DNA. DNA testing. Yes. I wanted to talk about, because the eyeball, there's I, this eyeball removal thing that he's doing. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So that is called uh, enucleation, which is the medical term used to used to refer to the surgical removal of an eye. Charles is known to have an abnormal obsession with eyes, going so far as to remove eyes from dolls and photographs that he had. I'm going to start doing that. Yeah. So, and we talked about him and his mom doing the taxidermy thing. So, he spent hours doing this taxidermy course, stuffing and mounting birds, and they, a lot of people said that they looked really lifelike. The only thing was that he, they couldn't afford the crowning touch, which was the, the fancy eyeballs. Eye. Yes. Because you can't use the real eyes. you got to buy fake ones. Yeah, so you, can't, you have to buy fake glass eyes. So him and his mom, when they would go to the taxidermy shop, he, would, he was obsessed with these fake with the fake glass eyeballs and he would stare at them in the store and he said in an interview that he loved their iridescent gleam and he wished that he could collect them like other boys collect marbles his uh taxidermies uh they did not have any eyes instead he had sewn tightly against their little delicate feathers dark buttons So if you can just imagine that, like these beautifully done taxidermy birds with just like buttons for eyes. It's kind of awesome, to be honest. Another time in college, one of his uh, college roommates said that, you know, Charles played a prank on him by removing the, uh, the eyes from the photos of his roommate's current girlfriend and replacing them with fo- with the eyes of his ex-girlfriend and then wanted waited to see how long it would take for him to notice. See, that's funny, though. Like, I think it's just creepy. It's just creepy. Why are you going to just go and do that? Like, I don't know. But yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't find that creepy. So this, that's, just, that's just a prank. So there's a little bit about his little eyeball fetish thing. That he had. Yeah, so we have him with this creepy eyeball thing. Three victims, you know, three women who were brutally killed. Now about getting some justice. Yeah. So now we have the arrest and trial. On March 22nd, 1991, after the murder of Shirley Williams... His last victim, a witness came forward and told the police about Albright. So he was already a suspect. And uh, so they went out and arrested him at his home. The defense offered a second suspect, which was Exton Schindler, who was a paranoid, fast-talking truck driver who rented one of Albright's rental homes which he made a good suspect but there was just too much he didn't have a thing with eyes circumstantial evidence that pointed to charles and not to exton now on march 23rd 1991 albright was arrested and charged with three counts of murder his trial started on december 13th 1991 Now, the prosecution suffered many blows to their case. The evidence, like I said, is mostly circumstantial. The only evidence that was solid was the forensic evidence, the hairs that they found on William's uh, body, which were matched to Albright. So what if they even had access to DNA? Because I know it's at the very beginning. Yeah. The whole DNA thing. They might not even have access to it yet. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it was in its infancy. I think they could tell you um, if it was male, female, blood type. But I do not think they could go into the 
the full genetics yet. So I think it was in its early days. I think around 99, 2000 is where they start getting into that like really oh, no. detailed. In the, in the early 90s, you could get you could get some some stuff done. Yeah, but I think like the the most detailed wasn't till like the later 90s. I don't know. Let's move we'll on. have to look into that. They have these hairs and all this on December 18th, 1991, the jury goes in to, to deliberate and they find him guilty of the murder of Shirley Williams. And he is sentenced to a life sentence for her murder. Now, the other two, they actually don't try him on because they didn't have any evidence. All right. So in Shirley Williams case, they had the hairs that proved that he was with her. So they had some, like, circumstantial eyewitnesses on, you know, previous stuff, but that he knew them. But they didn't actually have any hard evidence. I guess once you give them life in prison, there's no reason. Yeah, that's true. And that, that is actually everything that I have on this case. I think this one's a little shorter than the rest. Yes. So this is a little bit shorter than our normal one. I did, I did find that this case was very interesting. I did read um, an article from, like, a psychology magazine, which was really interesting. It talked about um, the, the eyeball fetish thing. See, they even use it. They use Sugar Daddy. Yes. Oh, no. no he had a Sugar Mama, not a Sugar Daddy. Yeah. He wasn't a Sugar Daddy. But he had rental homes. He couldn't have been doing too bad for himself. Yeah, so, like, his parents passed away, and he had these properties you know that his dad had owned his that his mom and dad had owned and yeah he rented them out you know everybody that said that talked about him that knew him they're like oh no he's completely innocent he was railroaded so i told you from the very beginning he, he's probably just a really nice guy and you're you, you give me crap for that um, it looks like I was uh, vindicated in the end. Yeah, there there was actually one one article where they were talking about uh, Charles Albright's painting, and they said that he took a lot of detailed time on the eyes. He said the eyes made the painting. So I that think that reminds me of a movie. Yeah, there was a guy who forged it, and he he would always make the eyes different. Like he would fa forge these famous paintings. And he would just, in the middle of his trial, he'd scream out, the eyes, the eyes. Look at the eyes, they're different. Yeah. Yeah, it was just, he's really, he's a creepy guy, but he's, like, super smart. Like, he has the qualifications. He knows what he's doing. He's, you know, he's had the courses in taxidermy, pre-med courses. Like... There's just too much circumstantial evidence to deny. He seems like the type of guy who gets really, who would probably get along really well with, uh, like, jail guards. Oh, yeah, probably. Like, I don't know. This guy was just creepy. Like, did I show you a picture of him? No, I ain't got a picture of him yet. Oh, my God, man. This, this man is just... We're going to tap into that Google machine right now. Uh, he looks pretty normal. Yeah. So these are, like... That's like actually his, his younger movie. mug shots. Yeah, you know, not too bad. Yeah, yeah. So that's like when he's arrested for these crimes. Like this is his mug shot from then. Like this is like more recent. That's what he looked like then. Yeah. So that is the eyeball fetish killer. So if you guys have ever seen the Criminal Minds episode, uh, that episode is, I believe, in the first or second season. Where they have that guy removing eyeballs from women. And then uh, he's actually putting them into his taxidermy. What they, happened? They actually, the, the Criminal Minds episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. like, he's actually, and it's literally this case, you know, 100%. And he's like taking eyeballs and putting them into his taxidermy pieces. And I'm just like... Oh, I rewatched that episode last week and it gave me chills. Just chills. So that is everything. That concludes everything I have 
on Charles Frederick Albright. Chucky Albright. Yes. All right. Well, that's episode five, people. Yes. What do we say? Remember, guys, stay sexy and don't get murdered. Dun, dun, dun.